Welcome to the Alex Monk Podcast. Interesting, fun, educational. We talk about everything. Today on the show, we are being blessed with the presence of someone I feel very grateful to know. Jerwin Lichtenauer, author of The Guilt Delusion, is an expert in guilt and empathy. I was lucky to meet Jerwin through a nonviolent communication group on Facebook. The thing I noticed about Jerwin and why I'm so grateful for his friendship is that he always seems to bring this next level depth of awareness to everything we discuss. Just when I think I'm understanding something, he shows me a deeper perspective, and that enhanced understanding and awareness continues to add to the joy. I experience this increased sense of relief and peace and confidence and freedom that comes along with these powerful understandings. Knowledge is power. So needless to say, I consider this man to be very brilliant, and I assure you, He's just full of gold nuggets. So I'm really excited to get on the call with him and see what kind of light and insight he has to offer into these topics of guilt and also a new way of thinking about money, currency, and the exchange of value that just may change the world, or at least your thinking. Feeling intrigued yet? Let's go for it. Well, I don't have a nice head, so that's why I wear a hat. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. um, Jerilyn Lichtenauer. Did I say that even? Yeah. Did I totally mess that up? We're, we're rolling now, by the way. All right. Okay. Good that you tell me. Jerilyn Lichtenauer. I've, I have a hard time saying your name, but I'm doing my best. Um, oh, that's pretty good. Thank you for joining me here on the Alex Monk podcast. And today we are interviewing Jerwin Lichtenauer. He's an author, expert in guilt and empathy. And we have some awesome topics to discuss here. Um, Jerwin, I've, we met through Facebook, um, through the NVC group. That's how we met. And I've always been really impressed with your insight and um, understanding of these things. So I've learned a lot from you and I really appreciate your friendship and your influence and your perspective. Um, so thank you for that and thank you for joining me here today. Um, is there anything you want to share before we jump into topics? Well, maybe a little bit disclaimer about my background. I, I'm not really from uh, psycholo psychology or uh, counseling or anything. I'm, I'm really like a a uh, researcher in, in uh, like computer vision, uh, recognizing things from images, a uh, really technical background. And I've been um, starting to gain interest like maybe 10 years ago and uh, wrote an article about autism uh, in a Dutch journal. And from there on, I started rolling and I got introduced to nonviolent communication in 2008. And I just read my way into it basically and uh, just started using it. and. Uh, listening to people, to myself, and uh, starting to form s some ideas. And uh, yeah. also, Carl Rogers is a big, big, um, uh, like, influence in my uh, ideas and learnings, so. Carl Rogers, okay. <clears throat> I'm actually not familiar, <clears throat> so that's something for me to check out. Mm, yeah, I yeah. totally understand that, um, that process, too, of just becoming introduced to something, reading about it, practicing it becoming more aware of it and it just grows and grows so it sounds like our our uh, experience is similar in, in that we're just passionate about learning and practicing this stuff yeah if you're interested in something you can learn uh yeah the, while you go basically i think that's that's my idea just keep on trying failing <laughs> uh yeah, that's how we learn. So tell us the name of the book you wrote on guilt, and tell us about that experience. When did you write it, and how did that how did that all come to be? Before we get into the uh, yeah. the name is uh, is the guilt delusion, and uh, it's uh, subtitle a recipe for love that uh, dissolves hatred, greed, and cruelty. Um, a recipe for love that dissolves hatred, cruelty. Yeah, hatred, greed, and cruelty. Greed and cruelty. A recipe for love. 
Excellent. Okay. And do you have where where can you get that? Do you have it on audio, by the way? And um, where can we get a copy uh, of that? Yeah. Well, currently it's just paperback. Actually, yeah, it's just an initial publication uh, to get things. And I I thought maybe later I wouldn't do this anymore, so I started with uh, what I considered the most difficult way of publishing. And uh, I will. I think I'm going to first do an audio book actually, because um, or uh, at least an ebook at some point. But um, well, currently, I'm a bit uh, short on time to finish that. And uh, well, I'll be looking if, forward. I'll be looking forward to, to an audio variety because that's my preference. And yeah, I, I know. You know uh, I I'm also thinking things. because well, I've got this written. People who can read easily, they they are already uh, they got they can buy it from Amazon or or from a bookstore uh, order it. Um, but people who have difficulty reading then, um, or maybe even. Uh, um, Blind people, for instance. I mean, yeah, I'm just thinking, what's practice. the next step uh, to 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 kind of make it more accessible and uh, yeah, yeah it, audio it could just be a preference thing. Like for me, you just can't get me to sit down and pick up a book and just sit there and read it. I just for some reason I just feel like like I just go crazy. But when I have yeah. it on audio, I'll listen to it over and over and over. I love it. I'll just right. soak it up that way through. Repetition. Yeah, yeah. I think that's good, it's, especially in in my case because this book is quite theoretical and you can get stuck. And, and, and yeah, and then you cannot continue reading, but if it just continues like the audio, then maybe that actually is a good way to uh, get people to get through the book because I think it's not very easy otherwise. Right. Yeah, and it looks like you got a nice looking microphone right there, so you, you ought to be able to get the audio, the yeah, audio exactly. version together. Should be, all right. So um, you had some topics for us to discuss today. The first one looks like an introduction and perspective. Um, casualties of unhealthy lifestyles and suicide versus casualties of war and terrorism. So let's get familiar with this introduction, this perspective. Um, what do you mean by casualties of unhealthy lifestyle uh, versus casualties of war and terrorism? Um, so, well, it's put it into perspective something measurable, which is people dying. I mean, that's not the only thing that's going on in the world, people dying, but there's a lot of other suffering going on. But if you just make a simple comparison of deaths, then what we, we're talking about, uh, which is mainly war, politics, terrorism, that's only 1.1% uh, of all the violence if you include wow. people not taking care of themselves by eating unhealthy and suicides, because we've got um, like 1 million suicides per year. Worldwide, it's an estimate. Maybe there are more because they're not all reported. Not, yeah. Um, and then we got 17. What is it? I wrote down the number somewhere. 17.7 million people died from cardiovascular heart disease. Uh, cardiovascular disease, so it can also be a uh, other things like uh, hemorrhage, hemorrhoids. I don't know. In, in brain and that, those kind of things, strokes. Uh, huh. But but in in uh, cultures where they don't eat um, the modern diet, that they just eat ma mainly uh, unprocessed foods and uh, mainly uh, plant foods because they cannot afford meat, heart disease is nearly non-existent. Uh, it's really a lifestyle uh, disease. And then that's just number one killer. And we also got, of course, other diseases that are uh, very much influenced by uh, unhealthy eating and, un and lack of exercise and our, s our sedentary lifestyle. Um, so this is actually a, a kind of, I mean, it might be even more than this because I didn't include any other uh, causes of um, lifestyle diseases, uh, death. But in, if you add up like one million suicide and 17.7 million uh, neglecting their own health by saying, ah, I just want to enjoy life, don't care about getting sick. I just want to feel good, put this in my mouth. <laughs> yeah, and, and basically taking care of yourself emotionally, but yeah, in a way huge. that you're actually kind of not taking care of yourself. Right. Why are we hurting um, ourselves? Well, I do see the perspective there in comparing those numbers like you're like that's like 18 million people that are dying um out of 
actions that they are doing themselves, intentional behaviors that they're doing themselves versus the one million that you mentioned uh, globally. Well, that's also included, like one million people directly killing themselves. That's, that's a direct way of yeah. uh, dying from violence. But that's like compared to 180,000 people uh, who died from armed conflict in 2014 and 30,000 people who died from terrorism in 2015. Wait, can you just say those numbers again? 180 what? 180,000 people died from armed, armed conflict according to uh, IISS okay. uh, um, and according to the uh, Global Terrorism Report of CNN, apparently um, 30,000 people died from terrorism in 2015. Wow. There's a lot of violence going on there. And this is just still just scraping the surface because there's domestic violence. There's 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 people crashing their cars simply because they're not present. They're up in their head in a negative state and they're sure. allowing accidents to happen because they're not valuing life as much as they would be if they were wholehearted and living with peace. Um, I mean, we're really just we're still just scratching the surface here because it it goes beyond the numbers and the the the, um, the violence. We're talking about an opportunity to enjoy life fully. Sure, and and if you think about one million people who succeed in killing themselves, how many people are there who they don't succeed but they still try it, or maybe people who just walking around depressed? Exactly, because even if they don't die, they're still just walking around dead, just walking around, yeah. just hating life. And that's it. That's it's just it's terrible. And there's an opportunity there for a transformation or whatever you want to call it to enjoy life as much as possible, to come to life, to get connected, to start experiencing self connection, connection with others, and enjoying. You know, like Rosenberg says, like making life wonderful. Um, that's the ultimate death. Is that 99% of us are walking around dead. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the numbers, but. I mean, yeah. I think also this example, I like it uh, to, to record it because I think it's also like what attracts us and like suicides and well, people neglecting their health. It just doesn't appeal to the kind of the, the guilt based thinking that, that we're kind of that was what I'm, I'm talking about in my book. OK, yeah, that's the next topic. Guilt based thinking is a problem in the cause of violence. Let's get into that. Let's hear about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. There's, a, there's an ideology behind guilt, uh, which is that if we can convince everyone what's wrong uh, to do, like a universal morality, if we, if we can find one and agree on it, and etc. The social rule of what's wrong and what's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the, idea, the ideology of guilt, that I can kind of define it like that today, but um, is that if we can convince everybody like that and we can agree about that, then that prevents people from doing wrong things in order to avoid feeling guilty. And, uh, and those people who still do wrong things, even though they know it's bad, uh, we call them bad or evil or inhuman or somehow broken or mentally ill or whatever. Right. And, and those deserve to suffer. And, uh, and, and it, this way we can um, kind of justify to ourselves to be... Uh, to be violent to people by punishing them or uh, scorning or whatever, that condemning. Um, that's that's how guilt works in order to get security. Huh. I want to fully process that. Yes, yes. To get security, it's like if we can just use guilt as a way to prevent people from doing the things we don't want them to do, then we'll see more of what we want. So it's a it's a it's a strategy to get people to behave the way we want them to behave. Yeah, well, it's kind of a negative way of saying, okay, I'm going to stop people from doing what is wrong, and then they will automatically do nice things and or live their own lives without bothering anybody. Right, and what a terrible way to live! Like I just know from personal experience, um, to be guilted, uh, punished every time you do something that that someone else doesn't like to be walking around on eggshells. I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about, is walking around sort of dead. Um, so tell me about yeah. this guilt-based thinking as a solution, which is our wheelchair for first aid security in separateness. Yeah. That's a lot of words. We gotta Let's break that down and understand that. 
Well, okay. Um, well, I, uh, okay. Uh, the thing is that I found out that there's no way out of guilt by uh, thinking about it. There's no way out of guilt. And it's, um, you cannot think your way out of a guilt-based thinking. And it's actually belonging to um, being in a state of me against the world, and uh, which I describe as separateness, like the idea that I can... I can suffer while somebody else is happy, or they can be happy while I can I can be suffering. Therefore, I need to defend myself by being against what other people are trying to do, which I see not in my interest. Um, hmm. Maybe I lost now the your question a bit. Well, yeah, we're covering um, guilt-based thinking as a solution, which to me I'm yeah. just like, huh? What's how can guilt-based thinking be a solution? But then the subtitle is Our Wheelchair for First Aid Security in Separateness. So I'm, I'm kind of picking up on that, like, if there's separateness in us, if, if I'm happy while you're hurting, or vice versa, if I'm, I'm hurt and feeling guilty and you're happy, then we're separate. And so... Yeah. There's a you're saying there's a first aid wheelchair that we could use as a solution. What does that mean? Well, it's basically what I've already said like um uh we using it as a justification for uh being violent oh. in a way that protects us. Oh, I see. It, I mean, it's like a protective use of violence uh, from our own view. So you're saying it's a crutch that we use um for self-protection is to make other people feel guilty for doing wrong things. Yeah, that, that's just one example. I think it's just a more general sense, a way to influence the world from a, from a sense of separateness. Okay, it's a way to influence the world and have power and control. But we're doing it in a, in a yeah. In separateness. In a, in a, yeah, in a disconnection. Well, I, I would describe it like a little bit the other way around. Like we're, When we are in separateness, this is our only, our only option. Oh, when we are in separateness, this is our only option. Yeah. So, uh, to be unless like, I'm you in just, pain, look just, what you've done to me. Yeah. To blame, and, uh, basically. To blame. Because we're not, we don't have the compassionate support. It's not like I can say, oh, I, it's not like I'm, I'm feeling free to say, hey, will you support me? Will you help me? This is, mm, you know, right. because we're not connected. We're not there willing, willing and able to support each other and help each other. Yeah, it's because like you don't even punish, trust that punish somebody it would out of each other. we got to oh, punish sorry. the behaviors out of each other rather than ask for it compassionately. So it's, you're saying it's just our crutch. It's just like um, kind of a poor strategy for fulfilling our needs. Yeah, I would say it's the best strategy, <laughs> even the, though it's poor strategy. It's, it's the, the best, best we can do. It's the best we can do. Oh, yeah, interesting. It's the best we know how to do. Inside of separateness, because why would you trust that somebody would voluntarily help you? Yeah. You would, you would need to make them, give them a reason to help you. That is so true. Pay them or... <laughs> or um, or making them pay them if they don't or, do it. Huh? Hold something over Did their you, head. Yeah, manipulate basically. Uh, manipulation is the is the best strategy that we have if we're disconnected. Yeah, and if especially, I think I like to see it more from a trust based perspective. So if I do not trust that somebody would voluntarily would enjoy contributing to me, I will just have to make them be afraid not to help me, or somehow like. Uh, Use the carrot and stick. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So you're saying there's another way. There's 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 another way to get the support we're looking for, and it's in connection, rather than this disconnect, rather than the um, manipulation that we resort to when we don't trust each other. If we tr if we can connect and trust each other then there's another strategy that we can, we can get our needs met. Sure. Um, okay, there are two ways to uh, approach this. Um, okay, there's another possibility. Uh, when we are, even when we are pressed when somebody's violent against us, not just accidentally, but really uh, intentionally trying to hurt us, even in those situations, there are ways to um, 
to use connection in a way to influence, also to manipulate, but in a way that we trust that they they actually want to care about us. They just don't see any way to do it. Okay. Without uh, without disrespecting themselves, so, so to say. Um, but I think it's also important to say that this is not something we can choose in the moment where we already chose guilt, because. When we choose guilt, we're already in separateness uh, mode. We're already, yeah, yeah, we're already at war and in defense. Yeah, and there's no way that love makes any sense from that perspective. No, now you it's cannot... just who has the bigger gun. Yeah, and, and why would I suddenly trust somebody I didn't, I don't actually trust? It just doesn't doesn't make any sense from that that kind of thinking. I can imagine uh, certain situations where. I was being attacked, basically. I was being attacked. Where, where someone's needs weren't met, they were hurt, they were feeling pain, and they started coming at me. And then, really quickly, I could be like, wait, wait, stop. This is, we need, to, we, like, this shouldn't be happening right now. Look at me. Be with me right now. You know, I can think of, but but that was with someone who I had, I had had trust with before. It wasn't a mm. perfect stranger. So you knew you could, they could do better than yeah. they were doing something like that. Yeah, I knew that they didn't have to resort to you know berating me and punishing me to get what it is that they wanted out of me. And so I, I just said, wait, this shouldn't be happening right now, this conflict between mm. us. Look at me in the eyes and and remember that, that we love each other right now. What do you need? How right. can I help you? And and I want you to see that that I need your support too right now. But the, but that was only because I had trusted that person in the past and I knew that we were, we had that we could connect that way. Mm, Whereas yeah. if I was on the street and someone just walked up to me and held a knife and said, you know, give me your wallet or whatever. Um, I don't know if I, if I could, if I could look them in the eyes, they'd be like, Hey brother, <laughs> Hey brother, we can do better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tell me what you need. And I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a hundred dollars just because I want you to have what you need. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I, if that mm. would work realistically. <laughs> well, okay. I, I'm, I'm trying, um, in the book I also mentioned, like, you can still defend yourself. The only difference is that you don't justify your behavior as universally the best thing for anybody to do. It's just your own choice in the moment. Um, because if you prevent somebody from hurting you, you're also supporting them to not regret what they did later. Right, you're preventing shame. Yeah. Well, whatever they, they I mean, whatever way they they see it later, but I mean, shame is also a form of guilt, basically, because yeah. or at least separate separateness based thinking, where uh, yeah. you think kind of doubting whether people actually love you or not. Yeah, and that category of not feeling good about yourself. Yeah. 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 Um. Okay. Which were <laughs> so we're on we're uh, on. Yeah, did you have something you wanted you got something you want to say before we before we move on? Um Well, yeah, um, Otherwise we're so, so, yeah, go on. So we to to get out of it, it's not a way of like uh okay, yeah. I mean, in your situation where you you knew you could trust the person, you were not going into the game of uh, guilt. You were not accepting the game. You knew you could play another game with that yeah. person. But um, normally when somebody comes up to us in a guilt kind of uh, guilt based way of violence, trying to force us to do something that we don't really want, uh, we, we're trying, we're going to be uh, drawn into that game and then we start playing the same game with them. Yeah, violence begets violence. And Even if yeah. you're playing a victim, it's still the same game. It's like yeah. you're saying, yeah. okay, you got, you're choosing to hurt me, that means that I have to defend my own needs and, uh, against you. Yeah, playing victim is basically putting guilt on the other person, saying, "Don't hurt me. Look what you're doing. You're you're tr you're trying to hurt me." And so you're trying to guilt that person out of trying to hurt you. Yeah, but I was also you're assuming that that they don't really care, even though they say that they don't care. Doesn't mean that they don't care. Mm. But you're accepting it. You're sort of accepting what they their their vibe or their their assumptions about you or how they see you. Well, yeah, there's. It's we're talking about uh, being on the defense, and if we're in a state of defense, then we must see something that is coming at us as an offense. 
Yeah, exactly. exactly. But also defense in a way that you think you're really alone and there's no way that the, this is not a game anymore. It's too serious. So you're trying to defend your own worthiness? Well, the, I don't know. It depends on the situation. Uh, yeah. But uh, at least you're, you don't think that... Um, I mean, you're assuming that uh, the other person cannot care about you. Something like that. That's what I'm trying to say, guys. <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, maybe we should move on because... Okay, uh, okay yeah. You know, you, to... This is rolling us into the next um, point here, which is the real problem. Why are we afraid of our own feelings? And now this part, you it looks like you got from Carl Rogers on um, the fear of our own feelings. Why, yeah. are we, why are we afraid of our own feelings? What is that? Um, I think there are several layers. Like if, like in daily mode, then uh, nothing's going on. It's like we don't have any feelings uh, or we have happy feelings and we're okay. But as soon as we get into conflict, then... Um, there are several layers, depths to our emotional experience. And um, at one point, I mean, I can read, I think I want to read a part of the book if I, yeah, sure. I can keep it short enough to not uh, violate any copyrights and uh, keep it fair use. But um, that, so at one point, there's a, where, there's a layer where you find that you have violent thoughts. Yeah. Um, and that's very scary. And it, it kind of like, pushes you away again from your feelings. Uh -huh. So you never go through that layer normally without any support. Ooh. Um, and actually you try to avoid it and ignore it. Um, but then in Carl Rogers' work, he found out that if people, if you just support people to, to, to kind of look at it and see just the way it is, um, they find out there's something behind it. Right. I can really relate to this. When I was deep in depression, especially towards the the later parts of it, where it was really kind of spun out of control, I my mind was almost constantly in this state of fantasizing about violence. And I was just like, where is this coming from? Why do I keep having these these daydreams about people trying to kill me and then me trying to have revenge against them or or even fantasies about me killing myself like and it it was just like my mind would just keep going back there and it was really scary so i kept trying to stop myself from doing it and think about something else and so i think that's what you're talking about is like we never get to go there and look at it and see what's on the other side because we're afraid of what it means about us there's some sense of I must, I must be wrong. There must be something wrong in me, and I'm, I'm afraid to look at that and acknowledge it, and admit it. So I'm gonna just try and tr teach my brain to think about something else. And so we're never actually objectively looking at it and processing it and learning from it. Mhm. Mm yeah, and I think it's also, I think we have to respect also our choice. Like we know in the moment whether we're ready for it or not. And if we say, okay, I'm not going there, then maybe that's the best choice for that moment. Oh, okay. Uh, and that's how we can help each other, but that's maybe we'll get, get to it later. But maybe I, I can read this part from Carl Rogers that... Uh, yeah, yeah, please do. And before right. you do, man, I want to express my appreciation for your... Um, when, I, when I hear you being compassionate towards people's strategies, even when they're unconscious strategies, or they're what I would might evaluate as, you know, a poor strategy or not not the best strategy it's like you're human and that's the best you can do in that moment that's probably what's best for you in that moment like you seem to have such um space for um people's experience and where they're at and that, that is so compassionate and it it's it's really like this there's this i feel a sense of freedom when i connect with you to just be myself and have no sense of self-judgment that like like you're doing the best you can like that's the best you can do you should do that it's 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 pretty it's it's insightful because i tend to again be in that place of judging like well i can do better i can do better and you're saying what you're doing right now is the best you know how to do and it's okay yeah you know, if, even if you're telling yourself i can do better you're, you're encouraging yourself it's also a choice oh um so do you have that that oh 
is there is there anything anything else you wanted to comment on that before you read from Carl Rogers? Um, well, maybe uh, we can continue with uh, after that with what, whatever comes up, maybe. Okay. Yeah, just checking. Okay. Uh, let's see where I can start. Um, It's, maybe it's good if I read a lot, uh, just to read everything, and if, we, uh, if it's too long, we can always cut it maybe later. Um, yeah, I mean, you're you're totally referencing Carl Rogers right now, and so this is a plug for him. I don't I don't think we're gonna have any issues with copyright. We're basically mm. just referencing. We're not gonna read the whole book. Yeah. But while you look for that, I wanted I'll I'll just continue to comment here. Um, just so our viewers aren't getting bored, but also because I really want to express my appreciation for your patience for people. Your le it's like, um, Jerowyn, you seem to have this, a real firm grip on this patience for people and an acceptance of where they're at with, with no judgment of, of where they're at and where they're coming from. It's like, I think that is what, that's what allows the trust to form again and for people's hearts to come back together and stop worrying about judging themselves and stop worrying about being judged when they see how you're so willing to, to tell them, hey, there's nothing wrong with what, what you're doing right now. You're doing the best you can. You just, you, there's no need to judge yourself. Um, I think that's sort of what like breaks the ice. Um, so, yeah, you keep it's like you like you. I've I've seen you comment on things before, and it's just like you just keep bringing me back to that. That um, like I posted that that comment on that meme, and I was saying, hey, why why are women? It was a meme that said um, women just need to be strong. You know, just be a strong woman no matter what people say or do just keep being strong and i was like and i was i was worried about that i was like man this sort of like promotes the idea that a woman should just be tough and keep smiling and just be nice no matter what and it's like they're not connected with themselves and you pointed out well that might be the best strategy for a woman to get through the moment of what she's what she's going through that might be the best she knows how to do and so that's a, that's the best strategy she knows for meeting her needs. And it was like, yeah, yeah. See, you keep bringing me back to that place of being able to make to be patient and make space for the humanness in people and just allowing them to come as they are with no judgment. And um, it's moved me, man. And so I appreciate I appreciate it a lot. That's why that's why I wanted to fully express that. I think it's significant. Yeah, well, thanks for that, and uh, well, I can explain it, but <laughs> I mean, it's also a logical choice, but um, uh, maybe I better read something else okay. first from Carl Rogers, which actually describes this. Um, one way of putting this is that I feel I have become more adequate in letting myself be what I am. It becomes easier for me to accept myself as a decidedly imperfect person who by no means functions at all times in the way in which I would like to function. This must seem to some like a very strange direction in which to move. It seems to me to have value because the curious paradox is that when I accept myself as I am, then I change. I believe that I have learned this from my clients as well as within my own experience, that we cannot change, we cannot move away from what we are until we thoroughly accept what we are then change seems to come about almost unnoticed. It's not, you cannot push it, but if you don't push it, you actually get it. Wow, that is a paradox. And that's something that's so important to be aware of, because if you push it away, it's the very fear of not being good enough that prevents you from receiving the change that you really want. 
Yeah, yeah you'll be stuck, stuck in your challenge. challenge. That's the vi- the vicious cycle that people get stuck in. And I see it as like we're floating down a river and sometimes we just get caught in this little eddy and we just do circles there for a long time. But when we're not afraid to get back into that, just accept, embrace reality and get back into our flow, of whatever, then it's like we finally get out of that eddy and we get to move on and get into a different flow, a different state. Yeah. And also, I think I want to acknowledge some some aspects, some uh, situations have multiple aspects, and we don't have to get everything at once. Uh, but if you can just get one or two beautiful experiences, beautiful aspects of it that kind of uh, that are meaningful to you, then uh, that's another step uh, forwards. That's Doesn't enriching have to be your everything. life. That, you're saying, that 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 will enrich your life in the moment and make today wonderful in some way, right? Yeah. If you can just yeah, get and one the, piece... And the encouraging thing is that it will repeat itself, so you can also look at the other aspects later. You can keep learning piece by piece. You don't have to get it all at once. Like Rosenberg says, it's not about being perfect at doing this, learning how to do this, um, well, what he calls nonviolent communication, but I think what he's talking about is self-connection and connection with others. It's not about being perfect. It's just about day by day being a little less bad at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're lowering your expectations uh, so much that it's like, oh, okay, I can feel good about myself just taking one step today, not not getting to the finish line, but just taking one step. It's better. And maybe thinking about the example where a woman says, okay, I have to be strong, I have to smile to people even though I feel hurt. Yeah, there's something not perfect about it and something deeply disturbing. But also, if they kind of, you, I think what you'll find is that if the, if a woman or whatever, whoever, it's not just women who do this. I, I can recognize this in myself. Also, I try to uh, just like be easy in, like make things go easy with people. Don't bother them with things that are uh, difficult for me. And if I acknowledge that I want to have harmony in, in my communication, I don't want to make things very difficult. I want things to go smoothly. And if I really own that, if I, if I see that aspect of my choice at that point, point, I might see, I might look at it later. I think, hmm, maybe there's a way to express my hurt without uh, breaking the harmony, without making things difficult. And, uh, and you will see the other parts, which are not perfect about it later after you are, uh, get more clear about what you like about it that makes that really resonates with me because what you're saying is like when you connect with your core need for ease i guess comfort peace harmony yeah beauty something like that um then when you really see that as the underlying motivator and the need then you you start your mind opens and realizes that there's more one, there's more than one way to the finish line. I don't have to. This doesn't have to be a war. I can just realize that what I'm looking for here is peace, and ease in in this connection. And so um, so we don't have to just go right to war and tense up and put up our shields and stuff. We stay a little more open minded. Like how are we going to accomplish that goal? Yeah. Yeah, and also I think what's what um, something I want to say also, which just got just came up when you when you're mentioning like the needs in like non final communication, you're thinking about feelings and needs, um, and you're kind of trying to find out which needs are uh, related to your feelings in the moment, and you don't have to kind of immediately come up with strategies, but just saying like, oh, I've got a need for. Uh, I mean, I, I met my need for, for ease and harmony by not mentioning my hurt, but also I want to share my feelings and I want to have authenticity in my uh, communication. How can I do that? I don't know. Just putting a question is, I think it's really going to start a process where you yeah. just takes time, but you find ways to do it later. You don't have to immediately come up with a solution. Yeah, yeah. And maybe... Maybe that's what Rosenberg is talking about when he says slow down. We, if, if we intend to communicate in ways that enrich our life more, we should be willing to slow down. 
Um, and I think that the urgency to race to a strategy or to go right to war, it very much has to do with that lack of awareness of what it is that we're really needing in the first place in that moment. So like when, when you do connect with that need, it's almost like, ooh, it's like a reality check. It's like, oh, I should just slow down right now and the way to get there, let it come to me. Let's just slow down and when the opportunity arises to connect, then we will. I don't... Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and sometimes slowing down means I don't have time for this. I'll do it later and maybe another time. Because sometimes you cannot slow down in that way because things continue around you. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. In a real life practical application, sometimes things are flying so fast. You're the only one in the room that is even wanting to slow down. And so you just got to use you just got to do the best you can right there in the moment. Yeah, maybe you can mention it so people can maybe pick it up you can never control it. Or maybe you are really desperate and you, you are in a state of separateness and, and then you just you can use you use your methods of guilt based thinking and making people feel guilty for what they do or whatever. And yeah, you're not going to make a progress there, but yeah, you, know, you make space for yourself to uh, withdraw and maybe uh, think so about you, it later. So that your head is not buried in shame. Because, I mean, yeah. that's the worst place we can be. Is because as soon as you start thinking, oh, my, my guilt-based thinking is wrong, uh, I should not do that, I should base all my actions on love and connection, you're creating more guilt. <laughs> yeah, that's part of the paradox. Yeah. Wow, man, see, this is what and I'm talking about. It just your, gives you more of it. Your, your willingness and ability to allow people to do the best they know how to do in the moment it's just inspiring to me it's like it feels warm and safe it's like this it meets my need for safety and um it's so compassionate and it's it's really i'm not gonna i'm not gonna evaluate it i don't want to put a label on it i just um i appreciate it um thanks uh, how are we doing with time oh with time we, uh... we're at 40 minutes right now and um we're moving on to, to bullet point five, I think, now. It's person power. Person power. What does that mean? It says, putting the focus of evaluation and decision-making back at the person. What the heck does that mean? Um, well, that's not something I came across in Coleridge's book. Okay, I didn't actually read the part that I promised to read, but okay. I'll just skip to the next one, um, which is about evaluation. Okay. A really yes. great concept to get introduced to and be really familiar with and really kind of like focus on. I've, I've found it very helpful to just be aware of evaluations. Just to be aware of them because they're flying out of the mouth left and right and we hear them all around. And it's just, I'm finding it helpful to just be aware of them. I'm like judging them less and less actually. Initially when I, when I realized that evaluations stimulate this paradox of trying to get away from our feelings and such and entering into a defensive state and how it can be problematic. Initially, I was just like, evaluations are bad. And that's what I was th telling myself. But now I'm, I'm finding myself more open to just letting people express themselves and letting myself express myself. And as it's coming out of my mouth or their, their mouth, then I'm translating it inside. And I'm hearing the, the, the evaluations and I'm, I'm connecting with what's really important to this person, where it's coming from, what need is coming out, what they, you know. Um, so tell me about evaluations. Putting the focus of evaluation and decision making back at the person. What does that mean? Go ahead and read for me or whatever. Uh, yeah, I'm basically basing it on the Carl Rogers' uh, discovery that... Uh, his person-centered therapy was so, so different from normal psychotherapy because of the way that he was not making the decisions, he was not make, making evaluations himself, he was facilitating his clients to come up with their own evaluations and their own uh, decisions. Uh, so I'm reading now from him, uh, an internal locus of evaluation. He uses this word locus in this case and also in another case that I'll mention after this. Another trend 
which is evident in this process of becoming a person, <laughs> relates to the source of uh, the source or locus of choices and decisions or evaluative judgments. The individual increasingly comes to feel that this locus of evaluation lies within himself. Less and less does he look to others for approval or disapproval, for standards to live by, for decisions and choices. He recognizes that it rests within himself to choose, that the only question which matters is, am I living a way which is deeply satisfying to me and which truly expresses me? This, I think, is perhaps the most important question for the creative individual. Wow. Okay, some of that really resonated with me. Do you have comments on that? Yeah, I want to say that locus is a word that I came across later and I didn't actually uh, relate, uh, read it first in this part because this is what I've, this, I read this book first and then I read uh, uh, another book. Uh, I don't know if I'm showing it. In, oh, yeah. So it is Coleridge's on personal power, inner strength and its, revolu in its revolutionary impact. And there he's using uh, locus as in uh, locus of decisions, where I just mentioned, like, he found that uh, he makes, he puts the locus of decision making at the client, instead of being the therapist who knows everything, how to uh, think and how to, uh, how to see things. How to diagnose or whatever. Yeah. Um, He's saying you so, look at yourself and you decide, you decide how to evaluate. You're the one who's defining your the way you perceive yourself it's not it's not me saying or anyone else well I really mean, people need to choose you cannot force somebody to do that but I'm um, probably that most of the cases people have made a decision they're just looking for a confirmation uh, from somebody else that it's the right decision oh interesting um, but what I found interesting is he uses the first in this uh, book on becoming a person, he uses the word locus in relation to evaluation and in on personal power he uses it in relation to power, but I think they're both the same. I think he sees power and evaluation as very deeply related or closely related somehow. Wow, there's a concept. The, the person who has the power is the person who makes the decision. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> He's the person who's doing the thinking. He's the person who's creating the feeling and that's the power that he has. Okay. So yeah, if you if you're thinking about what would uh, that other person what would what would uh, what would they think about it, then you're placing power at them because you're placing locus of evaluation at them or some imaginary mm, universal good way of being or acting. Um, and if we go back to the like guilt-based thinking. Um, that's not very useful because it seems like weakness if you say, okay, uh, I make my own decisions, but I cannot tell anybody else that it's the right decision. So I cannot use it for uh, putting uh, guilt on anybody um, to manipulate them. I cannot say, I mean, if I say I make my own decisions because it's my decision, because I think it's the best thing to do, I'm kind of giving away, um, I mean, I'm letting other people make their own decisions also. I cannot manipulate them through guilt anymore. Ah. So that that that's not a kind of nice way of thinking Ooh. if you want to rely on guilt. You don't want to be uh, making your own decisions. So you're saying we've spent our whole life learning to rely on this strategy of guilting people to get our needs met. And so that's why, that's part of why we're afraid to realize that each of us as individuals are our own evaluators. No one else can judge us. We're the ones who decide how to feel about ourselves. Like if someone can, can deliver a judgment and it's up to us whether or not we're going to believe that or just see that it's just their thinking um, and that all of our evaluations just are thinking. So I think I'm, I think I'm seeing that people are kind of afraid to let go of their strategy, their guilt strategy, 
um, because it's all they know and it's what they've relied on. And so it feels like yeah. the most certain thing to them and their most certain strategy. But so as they start to realize that no one can cause that to them and they can't cause it to other people, it's almost scary. So it's almost like that's where, that's where we run into people not wanting to even hear about this stuff, not even wanting to consider. Well, and that's also, I think, I mean, it's not like, um, that, that, that you should go from one way to the other, because if you're in separateness, if you regard yourself as in an in individual with separate interests, then this is really a dangerous way of thinking. You don't want to risk, risk actually feeling guilty. Um, Yeah, it's and you not want to keep that. You want to have the possibility to tell other people that they're doing something wrong. Otherwise, how can you convince them that to uh, right. behave in a way that, that is safer or right? Okay, more so pleasant? so like I've had experiences where um, I'm introducing a friend to this concept of empathy, and they say, "I'm afraid that if I start coming to people compassionately and." making space for their needs, then I'm not going to get my needs met. That they're going to walk all over me. Oh, yeah. So, they're because they're so rooted in that strategy of blaming, seeing, like, like pointing out wrongness and, and making someone feel bad about it so that they'll stop doing it. They're so rooted in that strategy that it's scary to think about actually connecting and and trusting that we are going to be a willing and able to support each other's needs. Um, it's vulnerability, and it's a scary thing to do. And probably it's not, a, not the way to go if you're in that state anyway, because probably if you're trying to explain to somebody else what you want, but you don't think that they like to hear it, then you're probably not going to say it in a way that sounds very attractive, attractive to them, and they're probably not going to do it. So, yeah. Uh, so I mean, it's very interesting, all very complicated, and guilt gets into very complex psychological consequences. That that's something I want to uh, make clear, but also it's not very re relevant for the solution. Yeah. Uh, in because the way there's no way out of it. If you do not solve the problem that um, you're seeing yourself as separate, then you're not really aware of your feelings and needs. And when you are aware, when you get aware of that, then then there's no problem anymore because you will not use guilt. You don't need it anymore. You don't need it anymore. You can just say what it is. You're saying you, you can address your needs in another way. You can just say, yeah, hey, look, well, what I'm needing is this. Yeah, and then you don't have to be afraid that they say no. You're There's nothing to be ashamed reality. of. You're accepting reality. You're accepting reality, basically. Well, you're just looking for opportunities to uh, to have more fun together. Assuming that it's more fun for them to have fun together yeah. instead of by themselves. Uh -huh. So it's more like fun, enjoyment driven, but I don't know. I, I don't want to say it's only fun, but... It just feels better yeah. than going to war. Uh, yeah, someone. not necessarily more cheerful all the time, but at least, I mean, uh, not as, I'm not using as painful. The, I'm using the word beauty a lot in the book because you can apply it to any kind of feeling. It doesn't have to be negative, positive. It can be a negative feeling as well. Hmm. Um, like the beauty of death. The beauty of uh, transition. Uh, yeah. Whatever you think that means. The beauty of transition, ooh. So like, the beauty of what comes out of suffering, maybe. Um, growth. Well, I mean, you cannot know what comes out of it when you're in it. Yeah. But you can see the beauty of the reason that you're suffering, which is something that you you're passionate about, even if it's something very simple. But uh, often we're suffering about not so simple things, so 
those are even more interesting. <laughs> hey, yeah, I think I think I can relate to what you're saying, I'm, and you can let me know if if this is connecting or not. But like, with, if if I have a need that's not being met and I'm in pain, and I'm I'm like, like it's really hurting at that moment. I now I now what I do now I'm in the habit now of of connecting with myself and saying hey what's the need here what's the what am I feeling and what am I needing and I, I bring that up into conscious awareness so that we can understand what's really going on and it might not meet the need that's not being met I still feel the pain but there is this really beautiful thing in just being aware of it there's some security in that rather than just being caught up in the pain of it and being up in my head telling myself all kinds of weird things. Yeah. Just well, at that point, you probably already made the shift where you somehow... Uh, well, I, I cannot put this into words, but you let go of the... This is not working. Uh, this has to work. And you go into, okay, this is how I feel. Something like that. Yeah, I guess so. I guess what's what's happening here is like I have to remember what it's like to, in order to understand this this state of guilt and this this strategy. I have to remember what it's like to only have that as an option, um, and that's probably why I'm. I'm um, but because I have actually like I don't. I don't spend much time there. Um, I haven't. I've just been focused more on being connected. Hmm. Yeah, well, well, when you're there, you're there, and then things are much clearer. And uh, it's interesting to know, to, to think about how to get there, because... Yeah, the because you got to fake go through the paradox. you got to go through those weird mirrors. Yeah, you, you don't see things beautiful. You see lots of ugly things, lots of yeah. wrongness, lots of this it shouldn't be like this. And actually, you, if you start thinking, oh, I should see this more beautiful, then, then you're not going to get there. <laughs> you're right. actually stuck. Right. You but if you, if you kind of like embrace this, whatever feelings are going on, in a way that is not too overwhelming, but also not suppressing it. Um, Just to look at it, hover above it, ob observe it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really something I, I'm not completely clear about. Also in the book, I, I I cannot really describe how to do that. And there are lots of ways to do it. I think for everybody, there are different ways that um, that works for them. But uh, I think it's also like, I mean, if you do it once, it doesn't mean that you solved everything. It's going to be uh, just one step forward. And then again, you have some other things that, uh, that will uh, give you the same kind of uh, desperateness for a different reason. You have to go through the process again, so you just have to kind of see what works for you. And, uh, because most of the time we don't look back anymore. We, we suddenly realize, oh, we don't feel so bad about it anymore. Okay, let's continue. Oh. But I think it's good to see, oh, hey, wait a minute, I look, I look at it now. It looks so different from before. What happened? Yeah. I think we should, should kind of start paying attention to, to see where, when it actually works. Yeah, and, uh, when it actually works. How did that happen? Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and just see how much different we can see things. And for every, from, from both sides, we saw it as this is how, how it is. But if you look at, you see, you hold them both together, then they're, they're completely different. Okay. We're at, we're at 56 minutes now. We're probably going to go over an hour, and that's fine. I don't care if this goes for an hour and a half, whatever. Um, but I want to move on to the next point. Yeah. Which is change through empathy. So your subtitle here is empathy not as a moral high ground, but as an interactive tool to facilitate self-empathy in others so that they can connect with themselves. So it's Yeah, I'm talking about empathy from, from one person to another person. I'm, I'm not yet talking about self-empathy, but it's also part of it. Because yeah, um, there is a perspective out there in the world that well, empathy is like oh, you're choosing empathy because it's a moral high ground or something like. There's that perspective, but when you really just see it as a tool, 
You're just like, look at this really useful tool that when I see what's alive in you and I, I see your needs and your feelings, look how useful that is. We're not at war anymore. We're in a different world. Um, okay, I want to go a step further than that because even that can still be a manipulative strategy to change the person who empathizes. And I think that's the reason, I mean, I cannot be sure, but I see people promoting empathy in the hope that I, I'm assuming, in the hope that in a guilt-based way, that if everybody would be empathizing with other people, they would know what they're doing to them and uh, they would not uh, make them suffer anymore. Doesn't that sound, I mean, to me, that sounds like a good thing. Like if everybody was just aware yeah. of empathy and, and practicing it with each other, we would be avoiding a lot of conflict and a lot of suffering. We would yeah, but not the worst kind of conflict. Uh, it would, would uh, make um, most things kind of go easier, but there are conflicts where people are deliberately trying to hurt somebody. But if, um, but if these people were, were connected with their needs and able to access other strategies to, to ask for them to be met... Yeah, yeah, but that's self-empathy. I'm, I'm not talking about empathy for the other person. So, suppose somebody is just more empathic to other, others. They don't really have a clue what their own needs are. They're just more empathic to others. Okay. Ouch. Then... Then still they might get desperate and they might want to hurt somebody. Even if they know how much it hurts, they would still do their thing. Oh, that makes so much sense. Yeah. You really got to be connected with yourself in order yeah, to... Yeah, so, so in this way, empathy has limits. But if... If you see empathy also as a way, as an inter interactive process where it doesn't help only the person who is going to understand another person, but actually you you, you cannot understand somebody else if they, not, they do not understand themselves. You cannot check it. You never know exactly if you're right about how you understand them. Oh. And therefore the, the empathy that I'm interested in and, and some other people that we know, uh, like Edwin Rutsch is doing this uh, very actively, uh, making empathy circles. But are you really going to a dialogue with the person? Am I am I understanding you correctly? Yeah. And you 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 Checking really in. listen to what the person says, and and they can correct themselves. Yeah. Or they, they can, can let you know. Them. No, it's not that. Like, thank mm -hmm. you for guessing that, but it's not that. It's more like this. And so you're really exactly. staying curious and yeah. letting them confirm and valid you know, validate when you when you're when you're understanding and you're there with them. Yeah, but you have to see that at the moment that somebody is doing that, they're giving you feedback for uh, whether that you understand them or not. They are thinking about themselves. And they are getting more clear about themselves at that moment. Yes. And so the empathy you end up in the end has been created during the interaction also. Because they didn't have the clarity before to actually even confirm exactly... Uh, even if you would tell them, are you feeling this and this and because you're needing that and that, they wouldn't be able to confirm. They have to think about themselves. And this is what I mean, is empathy is a tool to help somebody else with empathizing with themselves. Okay. Yeah. And then you can get what I just read about Carl Rogers, like, when I accept myself as I am, then I change. When you empathize with somebody else, they empathize with themselves. They accept them, their own feelings and their own needs. Then they can change, oh. but you're not you're not making them change. You're just trying to help them accept them as they are. You're just letting them, yeah. You're you're creating a safe space so that they can hover over themselves and look down at it and understand themselves. Now they can make choices that will meet their needs. And and that's what like the what college is talking about with putting the locus of power at the other person. You're really giving the power for themselves, their own decisions, out of your hands. You don't know what they're going to do. You don't know they're what strategy guarantees. they're going to choose to meet their needs. You're just making space oh. for them to to see their needs, and then they they can start seeing the strategies that will, might meet their needs. And then maybe at that point they might be able to even make a request and say, hey. This, this would be really helpful. And you're like, really? Oh, okay. Because again, you're on the listening end of hmm. it. Like, that's, that's the strategy that's going to meet your need? Cool. I'm not, I'm not here to tell you what to do, in a sense. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful, man. Let's move on to the... I'm sorry, do you have any more comments on that before we move on? Uh, 
Well, I can't really uh, remember now. Uh. Oh, these last couple points are, I thought, I was like, what is this all about? This is interesting stuff. We, you're moving on to mm. the role of money in centralization, globalization, and patriarchy. And then the next point is like practical solutions for our non-emotional emergencies, which you're, you're saying complementary currencies that facilitate decentralization, local food, local energy. You're talking about meeting needs that are not... You're, you're talking about like economic needs and how we exchange value to meet very practical, basic needs. Um, so tell well, us about this role of money in centralization, globalization, and patriarchy first, so that way we can get yeah. a perspective. But uh, it seems like a completely different topic, and I want to okay. make be clear that this is not a completely different topic. I, I've got a, I end the book, uh, The Guild Delusion, with this topic. And I, I put it at last because I'm suspecting people would not like to think about this in this context because it sounds boring and irrelevant. But when we are desperate, we do not have space to uh, consider our own needs completely and especially not other people's needs. Yeah. And the way money works, um, as explained by Bernard Littar, who is a German uh, economist who has been involved in creating the euro currency, but he has been actively promoting um, a, a multiple currencies to coexist together and to compete with each other. And, 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 and also make it clear that all the money we have on earth today in most developed countries is the same kind of money. And it's, um, it's, it's useful for uh, quick growth for industrialization, it, uh, it's based on interest, it, it, it encourages short-term thinking, but it also we see that uh, it moves around the earth freely to where uh, the profits can be uh, get, get quickly in terms of, terms of money. And that's, that's useful, but we, by itself it's going to destroy the world. It needs, it needs a partner, it needs the, the balance with uh, like what Bernard Littar calls like yin and yang, then the, the money we have currently is yang money, kind of male, uh, dominant, strong, uh, concentrating power. We also need a uh, money which is more um, uh, equalizing, more uh, uh, giving long-term thinking also an opportunity. And one way to do this is uh, have a, a local currency everywhere, but separate. So economies can actually uh, develop individually also based on um, a local currency, which is not valuable anywhere else. Huh. So if, uh, if a business, a local business earns money in the local currency, they have a, a, a market which they don't have to compete with international uh, uh, branches. Because the international branches cannot earn all their money in local currency, they cannot um, pay their uh, yeah. uh, their investors, uh, their stockholders with the local currency because they don't live there. To me, that's sounding like a limitation. Initially, I'm hearing like it sounds like a limitation. That's how I'm judging it, and that that it might hurt the economy in some way um, because it's not as free. It's not, there's the freedom of exchange wouldn't, it's just like you're limiting the freedom of exchange. So can you help me to understand the benefit of, of this? this idea? Well, you don't have one, it's not one or the other, it's both. Both at the same time. In every interaction you can choose, the person selling something can choose whether they accept both or one or the other. And the person buying something, they can... Well, hopefully they got choice also. Maybe they only have local currency, then they don't have a choice. But that does mean that a business who also is able to cover their expenditures with local currency will have access to a bigger uh, customer, a, a bigger source of income by accepting the local currency than a company who's not able to use the currency. So it's an incentive to look uh, how to cover your expenses locally. 
because it gives a, a mon monetary advantage if you can not only serve customers who have an international or national or an international currency, you can also serve customers who only have a local currency. So it's it's actually an extra source of income. Can you can you give me an example of what a local currency would look like? I don't understand um, if we're talking about a like an online barter system where we have points, or if it's like. Like literally, we carry around seashells in our pocket. Like I don't understand. <laughs> it can be both, um, but actually, the digital currencies have a, quite a good number of advantages. Which is, for instance, counterfeiting is impossible. You just have a registered set of users, and uh, they just transfer a, uh, money between their accounts. But if well, sometimes it can be advantage to have a physical currency as well. Like you got um, Ithaca hours in the uh, Ithaca area, and, and that's, a, that's an example in the United States. In the uh, UK, you've got um, uh, Bristol Pound, Totnes Pound, uh, for example, Brixton Pound in London. Um, and these currencies are valued one-to-one -one with the normal currency. But they're only useful in that region? Yeah, well, that's the way money works. It's only useful in the re in the community which accepts it. Wow. See, I'm so familiar with the U.S. dollar, which is like an international dollar, that that it's almost a weird concept to me that that exists in the world. That there is a Brixton pound. And yeah, but still, the dollar has a community. It's just a big community, and it covers the world. But um, a, a money is not worth anything without a community that supports it. Right. You have to believe that. A dollar is worth a dollar. You have to both believe it in order to be able to exchange it. Yeah, it's an agreement. I say, okay, I, I accept this, and I think I can spend it again on something that's valuable to me. Okay. So, um, are you suggesting that perhaps globally um, we should have each region should have its own uh, local currency, and that 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 would be beneficial? Yeah, but they're not just one. I mean, it can. I mean, uh, there are many different types of currencies that we can make depending on. Uh, I mean, every time there's a, there are goods uh, or somebody is having a capacity to do something or offer something to people, and there are people who want it, but there's no money to pay for it. That that's an opportunity for new currency. Because there is no money, but there are uh, people who have capacity to do something. There are people who are interested in it, and that there should be some kind of like um, circle that everybody can do something for somebody else, and etc. You don't have somebody who can only uh, receive and, and not do anything. Yeah. But even even in that case, there are ways to to support people that uh, that are far more effective than the way we're doing it now. Like for instance, uh, in Japan, they have something called Furia Akipu or something, where they let people help elderly people and get this paid in this currency so that they do not have to um, travel very far. Uh, they can give help to their family, which lives far away, by sending them this currency. And they can help people around them, which are nearby, which are much better for them to help at, uh, from where they are. What you're saying is um, in Japan, this Fuya currency um, I could go to work at a care center or something like that and take care of elderly people and be paid in this Fuya currency. And then I can take that Fuya currency and send it over to a care center over here so that the people that I care about will be taken care of. Exactly. But that's one way. And another thing is um, a Saber currency, which has been used uh, in a some South American country, I think. To use money that was available for uh, helping students get extra classes, instead of giving it to them directly, they gave it to one class in the form of uh, saber currency. Then they could um, spend it for the, the higher class to give them teaching, the, the students themselves from a higher class. And then they, those students could earn the currency from them, and they could again give it to a higher class above them. So it kind of cascades to, through all the classes, and instead of like giving the money once, it actually given is given several times, so it, it becomes more effective. Okay, so that's one of the advantages is that 
because the currency can only be exchanged for this purpose, it doesn't go to somewhere, it doesn't get exported to Switzerland and sit in some bank account somewhere where it's useless to everyone. It actually yeah, stays in that circle could. and encourages that sort of work to be done. Yeah, you've got people looking for jobs in a, in a village and you see the youth is moving out because there are no jobs there. Only other, other people are left. All the youth is going to uh, universities in the cities and they stay there because they have the jobs there. And uh, the rural areas are running empty. Everybody's in the city, you've got traffic problems there. Um, you can design a currency, which is simply saying, okay, currency is only valid here. Uh, which circulates and then you can slowly um, increase business without oh. having to compete for money which comes from outside. So local currency stimulates local economy and it helps the people in that local community. But then there's also this other concept of like a currency based on the service that's pre being provided. Like, just like you said, caring for the elderly or something like that. There's a currency attached to just that. Thing. So what you're doing is now you're you're keeping the funds in that industry, in that field. Yeah, it's not just about keeping the money circulating, but just to, like, like, for instance, um, a shop, uh, like, uh, I don't know what kind of big supermarket you have over there. They sometimes have, uh, they give stamps and you can, you can save stamps and then um, that, that's sort of a currency as well. Because Are you it, talking about coupons? Yeah, coupons, for instance, and then... You can pay with that, those coupons, but only at that store, and that's why they give it. Right. That's the whole point of the currency, to, to influence behavior that you want to have. And, and companies, they use it already to influence the behavior that they want to have. Why can't we use it to influence the behavior that we like to have? Well, you know, you're, you're hitting on some concepts here that, to me, are intriguing. And I can see that there's potential for benefit in this. And it's so new to me that I'm, it's going to take some time for me to process this and, and think about it. As I you know go sure. back and watch this podcast, it'll become more real to me. And it's a it's a kind yeah, of cutting yeah. edge kind Actually, of cutting edge idea for me. I, I, I yeah, it is really, really something you have to change your like whole kind of thinking. But actually, what I wanted to say in relation to what we were talking about earlier, yeah, the money we like use. That? Uh, the money normal money is promoting competition. It's making stressful uh, lives the norm because. It's promoting us to Work accumulate. Against. Sorry. It's to it's causing us to compete. It's putting us on a defense, a defensive stage. Okay. Yeah, it it ca causes scarcity of money uh, concentrated at a small amount of uh, companies or investors, and therefore, I mean, it's efficient if we make very big companies that uh, can process lots of customers' uh, orders or whatever. But it means that we have to go and find a job. We cannot make our own decision on what we want to do. Uh, and it causes us to have to listen to people above us. And that, that causes, it, make, it doesn't make sense to have a more a dom, a guilt based, guilt dominated kind of acting because it sort of fits with uh, our everyday lives. Wow. But you cannot, I mean, what I also learned from Bernard, I mean, that's what he claims, you cannot change one or the other separately. They might have to be, like, evolved in, in the, like, Begin yeah, the synchronicity. You need to have both. Together. Yeah, both. Yeah, if you try to change one and still have the other, if you try to change the social construct, but you still got the money that's not fit for it, then you're trying to fight against the stream. Yeah, you're if you're trying to change the money, but you don't have the social construct that fits it, people doesn't make sense. Now. Why would you trust people? You cannot change the money. You cannot change one or the other. You have to change oh, both. Somehow. So this is how the two are connected. You're saying a new economic means or strategy, a currency strategy, is, is going to be just sort of naturally... Um, the, the need for that is going to naturally appear as we become more compassionate... Um, yeah. and more supportive and we, we move away from this domination culture and we move into more of a har harmonistic like um, mutual social construct we're going to we're going to naturally see the need for a different currency system so that well we maybe not see the need because we don't know that it exists but at least when we come across it it makes more sense 
if, if I'm like now in a competing mode, I need to fight for my survival and my happy life by myself, then I want to have a currency that I can save on my bank account, I get interest on it, and I can uh, spend it on everything. I can I have power everywhere in the whole world, I can buy anything. doesn't make sense to have a currency which I can only spend in my local village. Right. Um, oh yeah, and also something that's big right now is a gift economy. And that's very nice if you have a perfect social construct already. But we need something in between. We need to go from one from one extreme. We cannot go to the other immediately. And these all these different kinds of currencies are giving a possibility to go somewhere in between the competition-based economy and the free uh, gift economy. Uh, anywhere in between, depending on how you design a currency and how you implement it. Uh, um, okay, I'm not familiar with gift economy. Uh, well, it's basically if you know your needs and you. Uh, you, you express them to somebody, say, I, I need a, I need some food. And then somebody else says, they make food. And I say, okay, yeah, you got some food. And if you trust each other, you know that they will go, uh, they get their food, but they also do something else useful for for your community. That Then sort of that can balance out, but how do you know if you don't trust each other? Okay. So you really need some trust for that, a lot of trust, and a whole community full of people you trust. In order for that to work, if you've got a community currency, you don't have to trust everybody. You just have to trust the people that are support. I mean, yeah, I cannot really. Uh, I mean, I don't know that much about it, but you don't. You have a lower level of trust, but higher level of trust than you, you would have now. There's some currency that fits better to that. Okay, so um, to help me wrap my mind around the value of this alternative currency or local currency let's just try and uh, verbalize what is the value of it why should we embrace this concept of alternative local currency what is the advantage for us so what would be the advantage for me you know that's that's kind of what I'm still trying to wrap my head around the value of this idea I, I still I, I'm, I'm my whole life I've been very comfortable receiving and spending the US dollar and so I don't see why I should even consider any other option what's the advantage well do you uh, have what you need you can buy anything you need I mean what you really need well can I do that with US dollar yeah so why not just keep using that well if you can do it there's no need to change but if you want to uh, have a different way of living, if you don't want to be working for uh, a company who you don't even know if how long they were going, they're going to exist. Oh, you're saying this going opens to... up freedom, different ways of serving your value in the community. You don't have to go to yeah. that job, clock in, and do that work. You're saying, and even if you're already in business, if you're already like a business, an entrepreneur. But you, I mean, from my uh, from my perspective, I don't want to build a huge company that uh, that conquers the world on some specific market. I, um, well, maybe I will if I try it. But I mean, right now it doesn't seem like my ambition. I think I would like to have maybe a small something smaller that serves my uh, local economy, for instance. But I cannot do it because as soon as I, I mean, I can open a, a vegetable shop. But people can get their vegetables in the supermarket much cheaper. Oh, you know what? I think I just realized that I'm sort of already doing this, and I'm doing it because it works for me. Let me share with you my experience. Where I'm living right now, actually, the, the way that I pay my rent is through a live-work exchange. So I have I found an individual who has this beautiful five acres. He has this place where I can live make myself comfortable and he says you know give me eight hours a day or um, eight hours a week um, doing work around the ranch or just helping me with whatever projects I need help with and then that pays your rent and now I find myself that I don't have to get dressed and get on a bus and go clock in somewhere and do some job that I really don't want to be doing it's for me it's wonderful it's like I get this variety of we're building something one day we're doing lawn maintenance another day 
we're painting a house another day. And what's what I find so interesting about this is that like I lawn care and lawn maintenance is something I have no interest in, right? In fact, it's almost kind of weird to me. I don't like <laughs> I don't I don't like the idea of growing grass just to mow it over and over. <laughs> but but because I see how it meets my needs that mm. it's like I don't care. I'm I'm actually I can just in, enjoy the fact that well this is the job that's right in front of me today to do and it's it meets my needs. And maybe next week we'll Whoa. be painting a house, or we'll be, or be chopping firewood. Um, but at least I'm not like clocked into the same damn job every day, sitting there washing the same dishes every day, asking myself why I'm spending so much time here washing dishes, which would just drive me crazy. Yeah, and you've got a personal connection with the, or well, some kind of like more casual uh, way of working now with the, the person who offers you a, stay, a place to stay. It brings me a lot of peace doing doing this live work exchange and not having this money going in and out and over and over. It's just a really practical I help you, you help me thing. It's it really meets my needs. Yeah, well this is sort of like the base the the idea of a gift economy. Although this isn't kind of like a direct barter, but in, in gift economy somebody gives you a place to live without you having to mow their uh grass, but you will mow somebody else's grass. Or do um, something, whatever it is that you have yeah. to offer. So basically, you get to do what you want to do. Yeah. Rather than having some uh, dominant co company telling you what you have to do, you get to... Well, you're not, mowing, you're not mowing the lawn because you it, meet, it meets your needs. You're doing it because somebody else asks you to. They, they like it for whatever reason they have. And, and then they gave you some, something for it in exchange, which is the place to live, which you need. Oh, so um, that's your gift to them. I'm going to mow your lawn because you need it mowed. So that's, that's my gift to you. And then yeah. they might say, oh, you know what? I see that you have a need for food or something. So let me give you this so that you can go over there and buy food. And that's, that's my gift to you. Am I, am I, am I understanding? Um, but I'm not sure what we're talking about. If you're talking about the outdoor specific situation or a gift economy or a community currency, it's, it's kind of different. It's, I don't know because this is also new to me that the, they're all just a big gray jumble. I don't know the difference between the three. Yeah, anyway. The, but I'm trying to identify the, I'm just trying to identify the advantage of this alternative currency concept. And I think what I'm seeing is freedom. Freedom to, to not have, not to not be a slave to one dictator like you don't have to have a job you just have to participate in this economy in this community and then you yeah. can go and do whatever it is you choose to do that day and it all come back around well yeah and it's kind of like related to this decentralization you don't have power located at uh, huge investors or uh, big cities but you can have it anywhere Ah, so not everybody has to move to Hollywood to, just mm -hmm. to be around yeah. 20 million people just to find opportunity. You can have, you're saying opportunity gets spread out because our needs yeah. are everywhere. Everyone has needs. So exactly. Kind of, exactly, and everybody has capacity to do something. Mm, 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 mm. So not everybody has to move to Smyrna, Tennessee and go work for a Nissan plant. They could just, they could live anywhere. No. Because well, the people another way of putting it is needs. that currently people are following the money. Yes, exactly. But, why, but the, well, we would ideally have the money follow the people. Okay, now it's connecting. Now it's ideally we would just, yeah, have the money following our needs rather than our needs following the money. Yeah. And it can always follow us because we can create money. Wow, this uh, this sounds like it's going to be a big threat to some to some people out there because there are some capitalists yeah. or whatever, and they they want the whole idea is to to climb up the ladder up the pyramid and dominate more and more, and that's how they gain their sense of security. So is this is this gonna are people gonna see this as threat? Do you expect some people to um to be objective to this, or I mean to be an objection of this? Oh sure, just like we're talking about uh, putting the power in person. Uh instead of uh, somebody who's trying to be uh, manipulating them. It's very scary because you have to trust that you're going to be all right anyway. Uh, yeah. 
And also, I think that we have to realize we will not be all right if we don't do it. We won't be all right. If so, even if you've got a lot of money and you're trying to accumulate it, and, and at, some, at some point, people are, if enough people are not being able to have a normal life, uh, sustain and what's the themselves. point? Yeah, we need an alternative at that point because, like, there's people out there who are working minimum wage jobs, forty hours a week, fifty-two weeks a year, and they're only making fifteen thousand dollars a year or something. And, like and that. what I you see is, that's I mean, that's my theory is that all this like little violence that's not showing up in the news because it seems so so everyday and simple. This adds up to the big violence and. In eventually, it's everybody's lacking. going to uh, be attacked or suffer or risk. Yeah, when uh, people get desperate being... from lacking, then bad things start happening. Yeah, so uh, but people don't see that it's connected, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think this all this terrorism is just tip of the iceberg. But we don't have to attack the tip; we can just shrink the whole iceberg. Wow, interesting concept. Okay, well. Thank you for sharing all of these ideas. This has been very thought-provoking. Um, and I'm probably going to end up watching this podcast a few times to soak it up and wrap my brain around these things. And I'll probably be messaging you on Facebook. Oh, <laughs> aha moment. <laughs> now I'm, getting, oh, okay. I'm understanding this more. So maybe we'll get back. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll want to do another podcast and go into a little more depth with a little more um, where I can participate more. <laughs> In understanding these yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, sure. You have to kind of like get some own, your own ideas, uh, kind of get some space to get them to, uh, uh, to, to, so you can explain them to me maybe and then uh, we can have some more discussion going. Thanks. Um, yeah. Can I say one more thing about this yeah. money and decentralization sure. and freedom? Um, I think a big thing is uh, we have to accept right now the things we can buy. Because we can't afford uh, something that's done in a more uh, eco-friendly way or a more oh, labor-friendly way. Oh, oh. we are There's limited no money. to. We don't have to. The, we're only li we're limited. Like if I want to get food, I'm limited to the things I can buy with money. Yeah, and, and it's only like the people who have more money than other people they can afford to buy some organic vegetables and nice fair trade stuff. But that's not going to be um, the bulk of the of the economy. Uh, we don't have a choice because we don't have enough money. If it's more expensive, we're not going to buy it. That's so true. With a local currency, you can actually make it mm, financially uh, advantageous to do something which uh, the local currency is supporting, which for which it is designed. Uh, so it's it's actually supporting the values yeah. that you have designed into the system. Wow, yeah, I do see that that what you're you're suggesting here that this will increase the quality of resources that we have access to. All right. And also that we can actually have buy them. We don't have I mean we can really make them cheaper or cheaper in the sense that we can afford them uh with another currency maybe. Um that we could not afford before. We we didn't have choice to buy something that's healthy for us. We didn't have the choice to uh, buy something that does not destroy the planet uh, if we did not have the money to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. Neat. Well, I'm and keen on it, dude. I'm, I'm keen on the idea of not being dominated by people who have more power and money than me and me being at their you know, at their beck and call and, and, and at their mercy. I like the idea of decentralizing that power and putting it back into everyone's hands so that everyone has the equality and mutual respect that they deserve as living humans. And um, they get what they, they get, they receive what they, they get back what they put in. So it's, it's perfectly fair. People should be, I, I dig it, man. It's, it sounds kind of anarchist to me. It kind of it kind of rubs the anarchist uh, side in, in me, and I like it. Well, that's something I'm really a bit uh, worried about because 
I mean, if people start adopting local currencies, but without being actually aware of how this fits in with the bigger picture and actually benefits everybody, even the people who have a lot of money and who are currently dominating people, they can find. Yeah, well, anyway, it won't be embraced is... unless we all embrace it. Yeah, we all have. Yeah, it needs to. It needs and, to be and it doesn't exclude to anybody. It doesn't. Exclude it doesn't have to exclude. And yin and yang. Business, yeah, and then even people who are currently trying to dominate. If they do, because it might also be our impression that they do, and they don't actually might might not actually, have, or not not at least intentionally do it like that. Even those people or companies or whatever, they find new opportunities with a new way that benefits everybody, and they, they they'll find a new place, and otherwise they find something better and maybe enjoy life without having to be stressed about uh, whether their company is going to make bigger numbers next uh, quarter. Okay. That that's not going to make them happy, and eventually people find out that okay, the more money I have, doesn't mean I'm more happy. Right, right, yeah. So we're circumventing this illusion that um, money is the only thing that's really important, and we're getting down to the underlying need. We see that money that's just a strategy; it's not going to make you happy ultimately. It's the underlying need that it serves. Yeah, and money itself is, doesn't have value. It's it's an exchange medium. It's not a it's not something that will. Uh, it is not even wealth, actually. Uh, it's power, though, because if everybody accepts your money, then you've got power everywhere and where people accept it. But if they have a choice, they don't have to accept it because they have another option. Um, then, yeah, you have to think, well, is the money really about what I want to have? It doesn't make me happy. It doesn't give me wealth. Maybe there's something else I can do. Uh, but I also like to, to um, kind of pin pinch this bubble that people uh, think about uh, there are people that at the wheels. There are like these evil dominant people. I think in most cases there are companies who are like an organism by themselves without a person actually being even able to stop it. It's just like a like a juggernaut. Um, people are just trying to serve the company because well that's the way they they're used to and they think they they find the, them they're they they successful if they can do something for the company or they're saving their own job. Or they're saving their community, which is based on that company, um, and that—that's the way the company survives and can do what it does, and destroys nature, and destroys people's lives. But it doesn't have to be one person who's deciding to do this. It can just be consequence of the way we are allowing things to happen. Yeah, cool. It sounds like a more natural order of things. Is what I'm and we don't have to blame someone. We don't have to seek a conspiracy theory or whatever. Uh, uh, how do they say? Uh, Corporatism. We don't have to have an enemy image. Yeah. And yeah. We can, but because the solutions are there, we can have the power to CRMs. create currencies. Man, this is really, really reminiscent of nonviolent communication and saying, you know, don't rush to the strategy. Don't focus so much in rushing onto the strategy, but seeing the need under the underlying need. And then, and then when you see that underlying need, other new strategies come into perspective and you start seeing these other options. And so yeah, you don't have to fight to what you do not want if you can support what you want. Then what you do not want will immediately or automatically be unnecessary because if it serves everybody, then there's no need to do something else anymore. Yeah, yeah it seems like a, it's a mindful um, transition that sounds really interesting and I I want to just kind of meditate on it for some time and, and, and see how I process it I need to process yeah. the concept of it because it's so new to me still well it's been an hour and a half over an hour and a half Jerwin thank you for spending this time with me and discussing all these different ideas um, I hope we can do this again sometime and man, we have other really interesting things to talk about. I know you're a permaculture yeah. fanatic like I am. Yeah. You're interested <laughs> in um, making your own fuel or um, mm. bio um, biofuels. Yes. And yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm a permaculture fanatic. So like, I would love to get into a conversation about that sometime. Maybe we'll do that next mm. time. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, thank you for having this discussion. Let me... Uh vent all my ideas and uh, plug my book. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's what the podcast and, uh, is for, to, to vent our interests and our passions and to share and connect with people. Yeah, I do think it's worth sharing and sometimes I doubt it, but it's good to have somebody who's supporting it and 
so uh, valuable, yeah. man. I mean, when it helps someone, it helps someone, then it becomes valuable. That's that's it. Can I can I mention the website? Uh, yeah, please uh, go ahead. Plug all your your websites, your links. Let it, let us know where we can um, follow more. Uh, so to know about the book, the guilt illusion, I've got the guilt illusion dot com. The guilt illusion dot com. It's delusion. So oh, it's guilt sorry. Delusion. The guilt delusion dot com. Okay. Yeah, and that will take take you to my blog, which is currently called lightwaterway dot com. What is that? Light water what? Light water way. Light water way. Yeah. W a y. Light water way. Yeah. Okay. Dot com. And what's what's at that website? Well, it's my blog. I'm actually just starting it, but um, and also I, I will uh, put up a, a subscription list where people can uh, be updated if I make an ebook or an audio book or something. Then great, so they can punch they in will, their email address and get updated when you're when see what you're up to what next. Yeah, but right now it's not there yet, but I'll, I'm planning to put it up very soon. Okay, well and, maybe uh, by the time people are seeing this podcast, then it'll be there. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> so yeah, All that's right. one way to find out. Hey, thanks, bro. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, man. For sure. I'm looking forward to our next uh, discussion. Yeah, man. All right. Well, I'll see you online. Yeah. Okay. All right. See you. Have a good day. Peace. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Alex Monk Podcast. Be sure to subscribe at alexmonkpodcast.com.